Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next guest is Paul Saltzman. He is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker. He has been involved in uh, television, very successfully involved in television, working alongside, directly involved with, indirectly involved with over 300 films. He's a storyteller. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a searcher. I hope that's okay, Paul. And what, what you're going to want to do is uh, check out his new film, Meeting the Beatles in India. And it's thebeatlesinindia.com. You can find out a little bit more uh, about the film and, and, and more importantly, too, about the photos. I mean, what, what's interesting about this interview, Paul and I, we, I mean, we get into a lot for sure. We talk about the Beatles. We talk about uh, John Lennon. We talk about how John, John Lennon's uh, comment on love about you always get another chance, uh, how that had an impact on Paul. This is a, a meditation for heartbreak, as Paul says, and uh, we talk about being motivated towards true stories and, and about uh, bridging the gap and connecting those dots between creativity and, and, and inner uh, uh, peace or that inner journey. Uh, Paul talks about practicing and f- a, a practice that allows you to follow your heart. We get into civil rights and, and, and about how storytelling does magical things. I think that's just a beautiful, uh, a beautiful notion. And, and obviously filmmaking as storytelling as well. There's a whole lot going on in this interview. I know you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy the film. It's, it's interesting. It's funny. It's nostalgic. There are are things there for everyone to take away. And, and wow, if you're a fan of the Beatles, you really do need to see this film. So do check it out. And don't forget uh, davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and about my speaking and, and my podcast face-to-face is there. Go through uh, the, the list. You're going to find something there. There's something there for everyone, almost 600 interviews. Sign up uh, wherever you listen to to podcast. Would so appreciate that. And more importantly, would really appreciate a review of one kind or another, whether it's, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts. A lot of people are listening to Spotify and Apple these days. A little uh, comment here or there. If you're watching and or listening on YouTube, a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel would be a huge help. So uh, that's all great. There's my little ad for Face to Face. Stay tuned. A lot more interviews coming up uh, from the Toronto International Film Festival. I've been away for a little while. And part of the reason is I'm now hosting, co-hosting, uh, guest hosting, I guess you could say, a show on AM640 out, uh, out of Toronto. And the show is called On Point for the time being. So check that out from time to time. And again, uh, Paul Saltzman coming right up. The uh, email, uh, sorry, the website address is thebeatlesinindia.com. The film is Meeting the Beatles in India. I know you're going to enjoy this. Stay tuned. Well, welcome to Face to Face Live. We are joined by a very special guest here with us today. And uh, believe it or not, I actually know where my guest is calling in from today. But uh, we have Paul Saltzman here with us today, celebrated filmmaker, uh, storyteller. And I think we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, who Paul is in just a few minutes. Paul, thanks for joining us today on Face to Face. My pleasure, David. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I'm, up, I'm coming up again on 600 interviews. And I always say thanks for joining us. And, you know, not until this moment have I really reflected on that before, but it really, I think, speaks to this idea of community and what I'm trying to do with Face to Face, this idea of conversation, trying to draw people in. And uh, I find it kind of embarrassing on one hand and uh, encouraging on another that it's only taken me 589 episodes to make that observation. (laughs) Well, you're bringing two things to my mind. Number one, George Bernard Shaw said there's only two types of people who have the right to use the word we, kings and people with tapeworms. Oh, interesting. (laughs) (laughs) And, And of course, he said kings because at that time, Britain was ruled by a king, not a queen, whenever he said it. Um. And uh, the other the other thing it brings to mind, and I sometimes mention this when I work with young people in in seminars and lectures and so on. Apparently, there are enough 
there are enough suns in the universe. There's apparently millions of suns in the universe, which means it's likely that there is life possible on other planets. And so I say, why are we all here together? Why are we here on the planet mm -hmm. Earth together? So what's the purpose? Because we could all have our own planets. You could be sitting alone on a planet all your own, David. It's I true. Could, I yeah. could be on mine. We'd probably be darn lonely. <laughs> I, I would think so, yeah. Yeah. We we wouldn't procreate well. <laughs> no, no. I'm sure there would be some benefits to having your own planet, but I'm not not right now I'm not sure what they are, but uh, I think our listeners are probably already getting a sense for where our conversation's going to go go today. Paul, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh Paul lives not too far away from where I live and uh I can I say we discovered each other not that long ago and it was through film yep. and it was through storytelling. And Paul's one of those guys, folks, that you can uh, sit down with, and within minutes, you'll feel like you've known this man most of your life. And Paul, that's exactly how I felt. We just, we didn't, you didn't waste any time. We just, we just stepped right in and we started peeling back layers. And I hope that's what we're going to be able to do today here on, on Face to Face. You're a celebrated filmmaker, Emmy Award winning. You've worked with some uh, big names. You've played Tiff and Sundance. Um, we're here today to talk a little bit about one of those films, but is it fair to say you've been credited on over three, about 300 films? Is that, is that right? You, your experience is wide and deep. Well, I think, yes, without without wanting to brag, because I'm not very good at bragging. In fact, I have a, tell, I have a story to tell you about how um, my two best friends didn't even know I'd met the, spent time with the Beatles in India in the 60s until I was going there to write a book. And they said, why are you going to India? And I said, well, I'm going to write a book. Oh, what are you going to write a book about? I'm going to write a book about the Beatles in India. Oh, why are you going to do that? Well, I spent a week with them in 1968 at the Maharishi's ashram. And they both said, you never told us that. And I said, didn't I? It's just, um, so yeah, I'm not so good at self-promotion, which is not a big plus in this industry where right. you kind of need to self-promote. However, I will say that I believe I've made about 70 documentaries and about 240 dramas. And of course, the dramas are mostly series because you can't get those numbers without it being a series. Sure, sure. That's a, that's a lot of time either, I was going to say behind a computer, but I guess behind a typewriter maybe to some degree in your your, your case, but also <laughs> behind a camera. I found a really great shot of you online car uh, carrying a, a tripod. Uh, you you look like you were right in the middle of it, and clearly, was, you know, you're, you're, you're a man of all trades, I guess, when you're writer, director, producer. Yep. Yep. Well, well, and it kind of comes from, and I call it the Canadian model. Maybe it's universal where when you haven't done anything and you're starting out, no one gives you money. And so you kind of do everything yourself. And I, I, I realized when my company was the third biggest in English Canada, and I had started it as a filmmaker, not as a businessman. Mm. I, I remembered one day thinking, oh, right. Being an independent producer is having the right to work seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can imagine. It's kind of your, your sleeves are always rolled up. It seems to me when, when you, that this industry kind of never sleeps really, does it? No, no. And, and with the independent model, you kind of grow up doing everything. So I've done, you know, everything, sound, cinematography, Editing, and directing, producing, writing. Paul, apparently, we're going to talk about this, but I, I understand you lied about being a sound guy, and we're paid five hundred dollars <laughs> for that that lie. I think that's fantastic. I it's it's true. <laughs> and why should I believe you? Yeah. Oh, because I lied then. I might lie to you now. Is that exactly? What you mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So, so hey, tell, let's let's talk a little bit about this film. So many things uh, I, I want to touch on and where we can go. And I think already any young filmmaker listening to this, there's a couple takeaways as far as far as I'm concerned about what to expect and about how to step in. You talked about funding. You talked about 724. You're kind of always on. You're 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 doing a little bit of everything as a filmmaker and as a storyteller. But before we talk about the film, would you consider yourself? a storyteller first or a filmmaker first, or are they in fact, you know, intimately linked? 
Yeah, I think I think they're in one sense they're the same thing. Certainly, if you're producing and directing and you know, or you're writing or you're doing all of those, you know, I think I think filmmaking is storytelling and and of course there's many modalities of storytelling, including the one we're doing right now together. Yes, uh, absolutely. What what and for me, face to face has all been about conversation and about you know trusting the ripple. I guess you could say that 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 this conversation will you know splat. Let's extend the metaphor a bit. Splash into somebody else's life, and there'll be some sort of change or some sort of question that's asked that's that's taking them in a new direction. Let's say opening them up. How how did you find yourself behind the camera or? Uh, wh- why filmmaking? Why not poetry? Uh, why not fiction? You know, you could have went into the yeah. theater. You've quoted Shaw already. You know, you <laughs> would that get me in the door? That's right. Quoting maybe, Shaw? maybe March, March on stage quoting Shaw. That's right. There you uh, go. By the way, uh, as as a total aside, there is a book, well researched, that makes the case and proves the case that Shakespeare was in fact a woman, Mary Shelby, a member of the court of Queen Victoria. And when she finished her research and published her book, she was uh, um, invited or made an appearance. She was, she presented her findings to the Shakespeare Society of London, England, which is a very serious group. And that, and, and presented her findings in the New Globe Theater of course, the old Globe Theater was where Shakespeare's work. Mm. And her research, the have you? I have, yeah. Elizabeth and I actually got, got to see a play there almost 20 years ago. Beautiful, beautiful. So when she finished presenting her findings to this um, um, serious and uh, studious group, she got a standing ovation. So in fact, Shakespeare was written by a woman and all those questions of how would Shakespeare actually have had the intimate knowledge of the court and how the court worked, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't. He was he was a beard. He was a beard. And how come he could afford to own three homes as an as a sort of poor playwright uh, actor, whatever else he did? Well, that's how he got to own three homes. <laughs> that's so. that. That's fascinating. <clears throat> so what was your question? I went so sideways. why why yeah, why film and why didn't you you write narrative? Why uh, um, why what, like you said there's all kinds of ways of telling stories. What was it about that what was it about it that pulled you in? Is there is there a moment or was it more of a um kind of a journey for you at the risk of Well, saying, it, <clears throat> well, it's it's interesting and and I think I'm searching for the answer as we're talking because I don't have a ready answer. Mm. I would say, I would say that I've been blessed somehow with the concept and practice of following my heart. Hmm. I don't know where that came from. I don't know whether it was my mom or whatever, whatever, or a, a whole bunch of different influences. But, but I, I know that the best way to live, period is to follow your heart. Okay, those words are easy. Now, how do you do that? Well, you ask your heart what it wants, literally, out loud, or in your head. And then you be quiet, and you'll get an answer. And that answer is how I ended up lying about doing sound, which we can go back to it all books together. So I don't know. I mean, I my heart led me to do civil rights work in Mississippi in 1965. Um, I was so blown away by what I was experiencing that I wrote some letters to the editor of the Toronto Daily Star. I didn't know a name or an address. I just uh, I addressed the envelope, managing editor, Toronto Daily Star, Toronto, Canada. And they found their way through our civil rights lawyers, smuggled them out of jail because I was in jail for 10 days. And then they ended up getting printed on the front page of the star, you know, Toronto boy in Mississippi jail and so on. And then when I got back, I got offered two jobs in television. So did I have a concept of career? Never. I still don't. Um, I believe storytelling can do magical things. Mm. They can, we can share our vulnerability. We can share our heart. We can share our perceptions. We can share 
inspiration for others. We can share comfort. We can give comfort to others by our storytelling or not. You know, I'm, you know, you can, I'm sure the person, Wenny Riefenstahl, who made the Nazi propaganda films of Hitler, wasn't sharing heart and soul. She wasn't sharing comfort. You know, mm. that was that was filmmaking too. Tri- triumph so, of the will. Yeah. So I got I got offered two jobs in television, and that's how I got into television, in a sense, by following my heart into civil rights. And that led to getting offered a job later at the National Film Board, and that led to being offered the job of being the production manager and second unit director of the very first IMAX film. Um, Some people think, in fact, the IMAX people in New York thought the first IMAX film was north of Superior. And I let them know that, no, in fact, it was a film that's called Tiger Child because we didn't know what else to call it. It didn't have a title, but it was made for the Osaka 70 World's Fair. Um, So... I fell into filmmaking Mm, is the mm, short answer. mm. And I worked on other people's films. And then I thought, oh, I want to make a film. And it wasn't. And I think this is the key, at least for me. I've never made films to advance my career, though I hope they do. And when I mean advance my career, and I hope they do, the hardest part for me in terms of creativity and filmmaking is the money. Right. I'm, I, I find the storytelling easy. It's part of my soul, part of my persona or personality, rather, part of my character. I like hearing people's stories. I really do. I like sharing mine. I like gathering in a circle around a campfire, sure, so to speak, sure. yep. either lit- literal or virtual, and sharing life's experiences for the purpose of lifting us all, mm. you know, and the purpose of laughing and crying. And that lifts us too. So that's kind of, you know, it's never been about a career and it's never been about fame and fortune. I probably would be more successful, quote, successful, if I'd paid more attention to fame and fortune. Interesting. It's fascinating. Pascal said, and I'm sure my listeners have heard me say this before, but the heart has its reasons that the head cannot know. And clearly, um, you know, and I... I, I you say you fell into it. I'm not so sure, but but I know what you mean. I know what yeah, you mean. Yeah. Do the dots, when you look back, and this also it can be traced back to Pascal, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and others, when you look back, do you see the threads connecting? Does it make so much more sense now than it did then? Well, I don't know how to answer if it made more much sense now than it did then, because then, then and now, I work from uh, for intuitively, and I work right. from uh, I work from my heart. What film right. would I like to make next? And it's got to do with what I believe that film can say to an audience or encourage an audience. Um, I'm highly motivated towards true stories, mm. um, and and in fact, when I made my my first film was a 20-minute black and white film on Bo Diddley, a one-day visit to Toronto. And my next film was called The Perlmutter Story, and it was about Perlmutter's Bakery in Kensington Market, which is long gone because the children didn't want to get up at four in the morning like the older generation to bake the bread. You know, they became doctors and other things. And, And that film, to my surprise, that year won the top three awards at the Canadian Film Awards. And what was a bit shocking was it won Best Documentary, lovely, but it also won Best Director, which was a surprise. And the big surprise was it won Best of Festival, meaning it beat out all the dramas, Mm. which is highly unusual. So I was interviewed for the first time. And I remember it was a male CBC reporter with a camera and a microphone. And he said, why do you make the films you make? Those were his words. Right, right. And I, and I literally had to stop and take a breath. And what came, what came up out of my heart, I would say, through my mouth was I said, quote, I make films about people who give me courage to pass that courage along to others. And that's really true. And it's still hmm. true to this day. Life is a perilous, tough journey in so many ways. And it takes courage to keep going and it takes courage to follow heart. 
I, yeah, I think uh, I think so. Uh, Scott Peck, Road Less Traveled. The first line of the book is, life is difficult, period. First sentence. And there are some people, some uh, critics who have said that part of the reason why the book was so wildly successful is precisely because of the opening line. That That's a beautiful. Admission, that authentic admission that, yeah, this is a little harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Paul, I appreciate. I really appreciate your honesty and your authenticity, and and just your willingness to sort of go there and go back there, and 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 having that courage. Can you talk to me a little bit about this film? Um, and I know it's a few years old now. Well, it's more than a few years old, I suppose. But the the this film, um, meeting the Beatles in India, you introduced yeah. me to to to. Uh, a story that obviously I have never seen before, but uh, you introduced me to um, a group of musicians that I guess I'd never seen before as well, and I was able to step in in a new way. So congratulations, first of all, on the film. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the film. Um, tell, tell our listeners a little bit about, about so this, it came, this long story. So it came out in 2020, but it still feels new to me because we didn't really find the right way to distribute it. And, and it's now being released now. Like my new distributors are releasing it in the United States in September. And a little shout out there, Paul, can you give us a little shout out where, where people will be able to see that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure yet, Okay, but, but the company is called shout factory and it's a middle-sized distribution company, like a hundred employees and a hundred million dollars a year in sales is I think they're what they quote. Um, it will be online. It's, it's online now in Canada and in some other countries. It's going to television, we hope in Canada very soon. There's a deal that's supposedly done, but I'm waiting for paperwork. So it's almost <laughs> feels like, it almost feels like we're just releasing it, even it's, though I yeah. finished it. Yeah, two years yeah, ago. And, P and, and, and Paul, just another quick shout out. It's thebeatlesinindia.com. That's my website. Yeah. yeah. Meet and we can yeah. find the out Beatles more about you, about the film, and oh, and also a book that you've written, interestingly yeah. enough, about the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, there's several books. The first book was in 2000, and then I revised it and, and did a limited edition box set, a very high-end limited edition box set. And the reason Beautiful. I did that... The reason I did that was when the book was first published by Penguin uh, Putnam in New York, the Viking imprint, they messed up the printing. Literally, they chose bad paper to print oh, no. the pictures on. So the pictures look terrible. And oh, I, no. I, I, I thought, well, one day I'll do it myself because somebody's got to. Well, and for those of you who haven't seen the film right. yet, the photos uh, play a pretty important role in the, in, in the story and the film and, and connecting some of those dots. Um, right. so, yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about how you found yourself looking for inner peace. Well, that's a, that's, that's the key to life, isn't it? How do we find inner peace while also creating the outer life we want? What happened for me was uh, I was working in Montreal for the film board. I was 23 years old. I thought everything was great. Um, I'd already been a civil rights worker, so I felt good about Paul, what he does in the world. I felt mm -hmm. good about myself. Um, I was working in film. I drove a sports car. I dated, and I thought everything was fine. And one morning, I okay, woke hang up on a minute. Hang on. What what kind of sports car? <laughs> <laughs> this is an important detail, Paul. A baby blue MGB, 19, nice. 1965 model, if I remember right. Was the top ever up or was it always down? It was down even in winter with the snow falling. <laughs> <bet it> <laughs> that's that's the, best. That's that's the, the best. best. Sorry to interrupt, but I no, just had, okay. had, had to go there for a quick and, moment. And the car makes an appearance in the film. In a, in a, one of the things that was a joy about making the film. Mm. And I made the film for a really specific reason. Uh, I wanted to connect the dots for the, the viewer, the audience, between creativity and meditation, between the inner journey that we can all access and maximizing our own creativity. That's really what motivated me to make the film. Um, it was a joy to be able to tell the whole story because it's a joyful story. 
And it was a joy to be able to use graphic novel illustrations to create the imagery for that which I did not have film or photographs of. Mm, right. So when I'm when I'm sitting talking with John Lennon or George Harrison alone, and they said things that were life changing for me, there was no footage. I wasn't taking pictures. I wasn't recording it. Um, so I could do that with graphic novel illustrations. So my car is in one of the graphic novel illustrations. So where it started was, I think everything's okay. I wake up one morning in my literally little rented room across from the railroad tracks, and I have a shocking thought. And the shocking thought is there are parts of myself I don't like. Mm. And I was shocked. I wasn't a very <laughs> conscious young man. I mean, I was conscious enough that I was, you know, heartful and doing things that I felt mattered but I wasn't very conscious about myself in a deeper sense. I was 23, you know, what do you know? And in that moment, I swung my legs over the edge of the bed and I heard myself say, I didn't think it, it came from the heart or it came from the soul. I heard myself say out loud, what do I do about this? And then to my shock, because I didn't believe in the divine, I didn't believe in God, goddess, all that is, I didn't believe in any of that stuff. I was brought up as an atheist in an atheist family. I hear my soul talk to me for the first time in my life, and I don't believe in a soul, right? But it's a deep inner voice that was truly all-knowing and all-loving. And boy, does that feel good, right? And the voice said, well, Paul, <laughs> I think I wanted to make sure I was listening. Well, Paul, if you really want to look at yourself more carefully, you might want to get away from the environment you grew up in. Mm. And it was this odd conversation because I wasn't thinking. I said out loud in this weird conversation, I said, where do I go? And that inner voice said, India. And I had no connection with India. Meditation, mysticism, I knew nothing about any of that stuff. But that led me, in terms of what you said about lying to, as a sound man, that led right. me to, that led me to go up to one of the directors at, in the lunchroom at the film board, who I knew was going to shoot a documentary in India, and I went up to him and said, "I'd like to work on your documentary because I didn't have the money to get to India." And he said, "Well, I'm not taking anyone from here. I'm taking a, a director of photography from London, and I'm picking up a sound man. They were all men then, in in Bombay." And then there was silence and silence is truly golden. It really is. Cause in that silence, I didn't know what to say. And he filled the silence by saying, have you ever done sound? And lying through my teeth without a hesitation, I said, absolutely. He said, okay, if you get yourself to India, I'll pay you what I was gonna pay the Indian sound man. And I said, how much is that? He said, $500. We shook hands. I went to the phone. I picked up Air Canada. How much is a ticket to India? Well, it was $550 return. So then I called the best sound engineer I knew in Toronto, Patrick Spence Thomas. And I said, and I knew him. And I said, he'd mixed some of my movies in his sound studio. And I said, hey, Patrick, can you teach me sound? He said, sure, come on over. So I went over to his house and on the Scarborough Bluffs, I remember, and he gave me a two or three hour lesson on the Nagra and microphones and sync sound. And I went off to India. It's fascinating. I love it. There's another lesson for any young filmmaker, uh, I think, listening in on this. I'm not sure the lesson is to lie to the, the producer director of the film, but I think there's some pretty interesting bit, bits of uh, wisdom in there for sure. Uh, Paul, Paul did, did, do you say in the film somewhere... You you wake you wake up. I don't. I, I I'm not sure. I like this person. Uh, you, this soul, all knowing, all loving, speaks to you. Do you say something to the effect of you're going to find a different me? Yeah. 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 That was that was in the in in I I didn't put myself on camera because I wanted to sh show myself. I put myself on camera because. I wanted to tell the intimate part of that right. story. And the intimate part of that story meant that the character, if you want, of Paul had yes. to appear and had to, you know, speak to the whole thing. So yeah, in 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 the interview that I did, you know, in my house out here, 
that is the backbone of the narration of the personal journey narration. Yeah, I, I went off to see if I could find a different me. And I, I literally didn't know if a different me existed. You know, I didn't know. I think it's around that same part in the film. And I, I, I would imagine we, I don't know, as a filmmaker, sometimes I in, interview some that don't want to give away any bits and pieces about the film and then others don't, don't mind at all. But, but there's a, another, uh, and I so love this where you're talking about going to find a different you, you're, you're on a journey, you're a seeker. And this is just so crystal clear. And what I love is that so are the Beatles clearly they're mm -hmm. in the same place uh, that you find yourself in ultimately and we can talk about that but what was the line a meditation for heartbreak yeah. and honestly yeah. paul i'm getting goosebumps now just thinking about that and i hope some of our listeners are as well and and i'm not sure what the takeaway there is i'm not even sure what the question is but it's sure. a beautiful lovely authentic notion sure well i can I can tell you how that worked, and I don't mind talking about the film. If somebody sees it, they see it, and it, it won't ruin the film if they've heard this interview, and if they don't see it, then it's better to talk about it. True, true but, enough. Yeah. But what happened was that, that my girlfriend, Trisha and I loved each other very much, and, and I had to go to India. And I can tell you, I don't remember whether I knew how to tell her why I was going to India, but she didn't want me to go. And I didn't want to be apart from her and she didn't want to be apart from me. And we both shed many tears, but I had to go. And I, again, I don't know how I expressed that. And she said, if you go, I'll make myself stop loving you. Now, I didn't hear that. Mm, right, right. <laughs> I literally, you know, you block. Sure, sure, block. sure. I didn't hear that. I, that surfaced later. And so I went off to India and I worked on the National Film Board film. And that was six weeks on the road between Bombay and up the West Coast and across Rajasthan to Delhi. And I get my first letter from Trisha and I excitedly rip it open. And the first line is, Dear Paul, I've moved in with Henry. And I don't remember anything else about the letter. I was devastated. I of was course. shattered. It was the, the worst heartbreak of my life, really. And somebody I knew for three days, I'm, I still would like to find him. I thanked him, but I'd like to really thank him. <laughs> His name is Al Bragg. And when I search on the internet, there's like a whole bunch of Al Braggs. Sure, and sure. I, haven't, I haven't found the right one. But he said to me, I knew him for three days. He said, why don't you try meditation for the heartbreak? Hmm. And I said, I'll try anything. And he said, I'm going to hear the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi speak at New Delhi University tonight. Do you want to come? And I didn't know who he was, the Maharishi. And I went. And, and there's only one thing I remember from the lecture that evening. And it was this. And I remember it word for word. He said, meditation takes you beneath and below your daily worries and concerns hmm. to a place of inner rejuvenation from which you come back renewed and refreshed. And I'm sitting in the audience thinking, that's what I need. So that's how I was led to meditation and going to the ashram in Rishikesh. Renewed and refreshed sounds like a great tagline for a yoga studio. I do restorative yoga. I would, I would say the same thing. If Tiffany was here, she'd be smiling and be talking about that, I'm sure, at great length. Isn't, isn't that what yoga is really about? I love this idea of going below. You know, I know in a, the, the, one, of the, one of the frustrating things for me, Paul, about doing a podcast and interviews like this is you touch on these notions sometimes and we're not doing a three hour class. We're not doing a lecture. This isn't academic necessarily, but it's about peeling back some of those layers. And I want to go deeper sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and often it's, it's you know, you, you kind of feel you're feeling a little pressed. And I know that we're not going to cover we're, we're just not going to have enough time is, is, I guess, what I'm really saying. But it but but I think I love that about life as you start to peel back the layers. Mm -hmm. So you quoted Shaw, I'm going to quote Chesterton, there's no such thing as an uninteresting subject, only disinterested people. I've, I've never heard that. That's wonderful. Isn't that a goodie? That's like, a so, beauty. so it's just I, what and I think this is what I'm trying to do with face to face. And that is, we're talking about this idea of of yoga, of going below, of meditation, of the soul speaking, and let's let's hope and trust that others are going to uh, start doing uh, a little bit, of, I guess, of their own their own research. So renewed and refreshed, you spent 
you spent a fair bit of time there, I think, or was it eight days or were those, those, were those eight days, the eight days with the Beatles? Yeah. So, so what happened was that I found the ashram of the Maharishi just by getting uh, on the train and getting off the train and asking and a taxi taking me to Rishikesh so and good. a boat. Yeah, a boatman taking me across the Ganges. And I said to the boatman as we landed on the far side, I said, do you know which way the Maharishi's ashram was, is? And he said in broken English, Maharishi ashram that way. And he pointed down river. And I found my way to the gate of the ashram, which was up on a cliff overlooking the Ganges. And even though I'd seen the Beatles in 1964 at Maple Leaf Gardens and their music had already been life changing for mm. me. You know, I heard Tomorrow Never Knows, which is the last song on Revolver. And that was the song, that was the, that was the moment that my brain opened up to, is there something about an inner journey? I didn't hmm. know. Hmm. You know, it's like life is out there. You live it. And so my first curiosity about is there an inner journey that I don't know about came from listening to their song. So I get to the front gate and I say to Raghavendra, the young man, beautiful person, number three in the ashram, I say to him, I've come to learn meditation. And he says, I'm sorry, the ashram's closed because the Beatles and their wives are here. I didn't even know they were in India. And I said, but you have to teach me. <laughs> and I told him why. I don't remember the words of heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Probably I started to cry because that was certainly where my heart was at. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I'll go ask the Maharishi um, and I'll send you a cup of chai. And down it to the gate came a cup of chai and someone brought it. And I sat cross-legged in the dirt, leaned up against the white picket fence gate and waited. And a couple of hours went by and he came back and he said, I'm sorry, the Maharishi says, not at the present time. I love language. To me, I love language because it's signposts, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I would have said if he hadn't said, not at the present time. I said, can I wait? And he was a little taken aback. And he said, oh, okay. And I waited outside the gates for eight days. I had a sleeping bag. There were a couple of old army tents across the path. And again, one of the joys of making the film is I could illustrate all this in graphic novel mm -hmm, form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then finally I was let in and, and I learned meditation. So I was eight days outside and I was just about a week inside and I could have stayed hanging out with the Beatles, but I came back to Toronto to see if Trisha and I could get back together. And we were too, each of us was too hurt and we just sort of mm. passed in the night. We just, we just didn't have the, the maturity and the resources to just sit and talk. We were both so... Isn't yeah. Wounded. Yeah. That's fast. Yeah. Fast. Fascinating. When Paul, when you met the Beatles around the table, if I remember correctly, it was, it was through, well, your sense of humor and their receptivity, was it not? Uh, and didn't John Lennon make some comment about, Oh, I guess you, you, you colonials are still pretty funny or something or something was, like that. It was really, really dear. I'll just give you the short version of it. And and um, so I do this meditation. I learn meditation. It takes five minutes. I do a 30-minute meditation, and it's an absolute miracle, David. Hmm. The, knife, the knife in the heart is gone in wow. 30 minutes. Wow. The, the sort of screaming in my own head of pain was gone in 30 minutes. I still love Trisha and it actually took me a couple of years to get over her in the sense of, of, you know, whatever, holding on or mm, slightly mm. holding on. But, but what happened was that I come out of the meditation and I'm stoned, I'm buzzed, I'm high, I'm in an altered state. And George Harrison, when we were talking alone together one day later, he said, I get higher meditating than I ever did on drugs. And I know what he meant because right, I had done right. drugs and I, and I had had that experience. So I'm walking through the ashram, which is not very big. I don't know, quarter of a mile by quarter of a mile, something. And I'm not even thinking of the Beatles. They're not even in my mind. I'm just so elated to not be in, a, in agony. I'm, I'm stoned. I'm blissed out, so to speak. And I see as I'm walking along, I notice about 150 feet away off by the edge of the 
the ashram, I see John Wennon sitting at a table. And, and again, it wasn't, it, 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 the, the blessing was I was in an altered state. So I didn't think, oh, it's John Wennon. I just literally found myself curving in that direction. I mean, I can't say it any more specifically. I found myself curving. I'm halfway to the table where I see him sitting and I see that Paul's sitting opposite him. The rest of the people are obscured by the foliage. Uh, and I just notice as I get about halfway there, I just notice, oh, my heart's beating a little faster, like literally detached, altered state. I'm not feeling tense. I'm totally relaxed. I'm in the flow, but I notice, oh, my heart's beating a little faster. And I get to the end of the table and there are the four Beatles and their four partners, Patty Boyd with George's wife and Cynthia Lennon, John's wife, and Jane Asher, Paul's girlfriend, and Maureen Starkey, Ringo's wife, and Mal Evans, their roadie, and Mia Farrow, the American actress, and Mike Love of the Beach Boys, and Donovan, the uh, Scottish folk singer. <laughs> and they're, That's quite a picnic. That's quite a picnic. And they're just chatting. And I don't say anything. I'm standing at the end of the table. I don't want to interrupt. And after a moment, they stop talking because somebody's standing there. <laughs> right. And John looks up at me and I just said, totally calm, totally calm because of the altered state. I said, may I join you? And he said, sure, mate, pull up a chair. And Paul turns to me and says, come and sit here. And I sit down and then three magical things happen. And, and um, I love the word magic. I found myself talking about signposts and language. <clears throat> I found myself using it, starting to use it about 15 years ago. And so I went to the big Oxford etymological dictionary because I thought, well, I know how I mean it. I wonder what the dictionary says. And as I read down the 25 meanings of magic, I realized and I don't, I don't use the dictionary hardly at all. So I just realized, oh, well, the most common usage is number one. And as you go down, it becomes more esoteric, the meanings, the less common usage. <clears throat> and of the 25 meanings, down around 23 or 24, I find exactly what I'm looking for. And it says, magic, quote, that which is real, but we as yet do not understand, close quote. <laughs> nice. nice. And that was 23. That was 23 or 24. So what happened was three magical things happen. As soon as I sit down, <clears throat> as soon as my bum hits the chair, I hear this scream in my head, like I'm shocked, a scream, eek, it's the Beatles. <laughs> well, I've never said that in my life. When I saw them live, I wasn't screaming. I was like this trying to hear them from the upper cheap seats in Maple Leaf Gardens. I've, I've been up there in the greens to see Billy Joel, actually, in the day. Yeah, yeah. well, you had more money then because I was up in the greys, which I think are behind the greens, I think. I can't remember. And um, so I hear this scream in my head, eek, it's the Beatles. And before I had a chance to think, and this is the key, this is the key to hearing, and you said it, you know, the head and the heart, the way you said it, um, and one of the greatest sages I've ever worked with in terms of my own unfolding, my own evolution, said if he had to sum up all his books and all his lectures and everything he knows into one sentence, he said, it's all about integrating the head and the heart. So good. So good. So without thinking, before I have a chance to think, I hear my soul talk to me for the second time in my life. And in that deep, all reassuring, all loving voice, I hear my soul say, hey, Paul, they're just ordinary people like you. Everyone farts and is afraid in the night. That's what it said. And as soon as that finished, again, before I had a chance to really get into my head, John turns to me and he says uh, in a toying, tart playing with me in a way that Lennon is so brilliantly um, playful and tart. He says to me, and it's not a compliment, he says, so you're American then. <laughs> and, and it's literally the superior British attitude to the Yankees. He's, he's playing that role. Sure, so, sure. So you're American then. And I say, no, Canadian. And he turns to the rest of the group and he says, ah, 
he's from one of the colonies. <laughs> it's very so now, funny. So now we're all laughing. And he turns back to me and he says, so you're still worshiping Her Highness then? And I say, no, not personally. And then Paul and Ringo start teasing me about having the queen on our money. Right. And I say, well, hey, we may have the queen on our money, but she lives with you guys. <laughs> and so we're all laughing. <laughs> right. and, and as we're all laughing, Cynthia Lennon from down the table, who clearly knows how they tease and how they play as, as, as individuals, she says, come on, chaps, leave the poor guy alone. He's just arrived. At which point, John turns back to the rest of the group and he says, ah, you see, they still have a sense of humor in the colonies. And that was it. They just took me into their group. I so spent good. a week with them. I spent a week with them. I could have spent the following six weeks with them, you know, but I didn't because... Yeah. It, it, it's remarkable. I love the story because there's so much, uh, uh, well, there's not only just so much experience there, there's just, there's wisdom there, but there's also just this sense of um, authenticity at the risk of sounding again, cliche, but humanity, you know, mm -hmm, at, mm -hmm. at, 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 and, and the, and the way in for you really was uh, through comedy. Comedy is the wrong word, but through laughter, that's my, that might yeah. be a more embodied way to talk about it, yeah. you know? And, and, but it was, but it was on both sides. There was a give and there was a take there, right? There was yeah, a humility exactly. on their side and there was an inability to, or an ability for you to see through the, 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 the simulacra, can I use that word of stardom? How's that? Sure. No, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really beautiful, Paul. And I hope, I hope uh, listeners are getting a sense for what this film is like and, 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 and what you're like for sure. And, and it's going to drive them towards meeting the Beatles in India. And again, I just want to say it's the Beatles in India.com. Uh, Paul, we got to wrap up in a couple of minutes. And I think I feel a part two coming, uh, down the road at some point, uh, per perhaps we can do a conference, uh, uh, it, honestly, there's 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 something else going on here. I I, I really love this. Um, couple thoughts. I think you say something about. Well, first of all, John Lennon says to you, "There's always a second chance." Yeah, yeah. And you say something to the effect of this experience and their music, and maybe more importantly, even their music woke up your ability to love. And this, to me. Again, more goosebumps. So thanks for that. But I think that, you know, there's something deeply uh, meaningful and important there. And I wondered if you could just sort of take us out over the next couple of minutes sure. talking about that. Um, yeah, well, into the yeah. wokeness. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, uh, at, I ended the film because it felt right with, um, you know, sitting on the bench at the edge of the cliff overlooking the Ganges doing a little meditation, which is what I wanted to do. I, it wasn't being filmed for me to talk. I, I wanted to do a little meditation, just close my eyes. Didn't know if I'd use it or not in the film. Um, and and it, what became obvious was Morgan Freeman, who narrates the film, although there isn't much narration because it's first person storytelling. So there's a line of his leading to my last lines. And what I realized in terms of my relationship with my own creativity, number one, the Beatles inspired my own creativity by their creativity, by osmosis, by listening to their wonderful, joyful music in, you know, before I ever went to India, um, before I ever saw them alive. And I realized that, that the meditation and sitting with them and talking and um, never thinking of them as the Beatles from the mm. first moment mm. when I sat down and the and the fan the fans screamed eek it's the Beatles and the soul said hey Paul they're just ordinary people I spent a week with them I literally never thought of them as the Beatles again I could have had autographs I could have had pictures with them because they took me into their group I just never thought of it. it it wasn't like I thought of it and said oh no I shouldn't ask never thought of it so yes their music and meeting them um, helped open my heart to a different kind of love, to a more expansive kind of love. Mm, mm. And I think what draws people to their music, just my own opinion, is that it's not only joyful, but a great deal of their music talks about love. 
a more expansive kind of love. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's a beautiful way to wrap this up. I feel a little frustrated that we, as I mentioned earlier, we barely scratched the surface uh, on on so many things, including the film. And I think you've you've, I don't know, we've covered a we've covered a lot of ground, uh, really. And can can you believe it was that long ago? Sixty sixty eight. No. Isn't it remarkable no. that here yeah. we are? <clears throat> I mean, it, to me, Paul, it's just so beautiful. It sounds like for you, it was like just like yesterday. And and if whenever I talk about it, when I'm asked to talk about it, I just feel like it's right here, right now. It's so good. It's so good. And, that, and I think that's the joy and the transformational impact it had on me. I mean, I still get people asking me if I'll take them to India because of that. I've now been to India more than 60 times. Wow. And so... And when are, and when are you going back? Well, I'm going to lead another small tour group to India kind of wonderful, joyful uh, in September of 2023. We've canceled trips because of COVID, sure, but sure. we're hoping in 2023, the fall, we can go again. Amazing. Well, listen, uh, Paul, thank you so much for your time today and your generosity and your your openness. The, 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 the film is Meeting the Beatles in India. Paul Saltzman, look him up on IMDb, folks. You'll be blown away. Uh, and Paul, just help us out here. It's thebeatlesinindia.com. That's where people will be able to find out more about the work, your books, but also how to see the film. Yes, and I hope we've done it right on the website so how they can see the film. But also, <clears throat> if, if you have any questions or anybody does, you can email me through my website. It's easy. Beautiful, beautiful, and you uh, are super accessible too. That's uh, what it, what uh, it's a real bonus. Thanks, Paul Paul Salzman today on Face to Face. Thanks so much for your time today, Paul. Thank you, David. Well, there you have it. My interview with Paul Saltzman, and uh, what what a what a great interview it was. What a, what a great time I had. I guess I should should say. I'll let you decide that. But I think you could hear the passion and the purpose and and and, and, and the joy uh, there in the conversation I had with Paul. It is about following your own heart. It's about storytelling and looking for inner peace. And, and don't forget John Lennon's advice that you know uh, on when it comes to love, you always get uh, another chance. Uh, don't forget to. Leave leave us a review, please do that. Uh, DavidPeckLive.com for more information about what I do. You can get, get a copy of Real Changes Incremental there, but please do leave us a review. Sign up for the podcast wherever you listen uh, to the feed, whether it's Apple or Spotify or you know SoundCloud. There are other places. Please sign up. Leave us a review. We'd appreciate it and social mediate the heck out of us. Share it with friends and family and, and I don't know, even with people you don't know, we would appreciate it and it helps us get uh, word out on the street and you know what my name's David Peck and this is face to face <laughs>